Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. I know that you know there's going to be a lot of digesting, and, and everyone's going to have that like after lunch sluggishness going on. So um, we're going to you know hopefully liven things up a little bit and kick things off with the most rapid fire panel you've ever seen. Um, so we had so many submissions to our lovely little DevNet Create conference that all our 40 minute slots, we thought actually we'd prefer to get more speakers on than our 20 minute slots. So um, please do give it up to these wonderful, wonderful people who are willing to try and fit a panel into 20 minutes. Um, you know, energy is probably what we need after lunch. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Val um, and, and introductions and take it away. Micro introduction. So thank you, Matt. I'm Val Bercovici. I'm the former CTO of the Solid Fire division at NetApp, a storage company. Now the founder of an AI company focused on data center supportability, and I'm moderating your lightning panel here. I'll let Mark introduce himself, and we'll follow on down the line. Hi, I'm Mark Teeley, CIO and CSO at uh, AppSera. We're a container management platform right here in San Francisco. I'm uh, Stephen Day from Docker. Um, I work on ContainerD and OCI and SwarmKit and various other projects there. I'm uh, Mackenzie Burnett. I am a product manager at CoreOS, um, and I joined CoreOS through the acquisition of my company, Redspread. And um, CoreOS, we build um, Kubernetes and container ecosystem open source projects and solutions. So this is, uh, by and large, the CNCF, the Cloud Native and Compute Foundation panel. We're all members. And one of the, I think, opening questions I always like to talk about here is, Almost everyone knows Kubernetes as one of the cornerstone projects of the CNCF. I'd like each one of you to discuss another project, probably ideally within the CNCF, that you're working on and you know what's cool about it. Yeah, for us um, at AppSera, we're still relatively small, but uh, where we're participating and hoping to participate more is with uh, our own introduction of NATS to CNCF. Uh, uh, it's a uh, messaging platform. And uh, still nascent, uh, but uh, we're in the process of productizing it now from a usability standpoint, so it's getting very close. But that's where we're spending most of our time. And, and the reality is, is that uh, we'd be spending more time on other projects if it wasn't for the fact that our own product competes with some of those projects. And it would be fair to categorize Nats as PubSub on steroids, or? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, that would be cool. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, uh, I work on Containerd, so I'll, I'll leave that one off the table. But um, the other two projects that really excite me are Prometheus and Open Tracing. Um, both of these two projects can help with the observability in your distributed systems that we're creating with containers. So um, hopefully those can help to uh, <laughs> basically we, we have this problem where we, we wonder what these things are doing in these giant clouds, and, and both of those projects will help us uh, to, to better run those things, to better understand what they're doing from both a metrics perspective and then also a tracing perspective. So those, those are the two projects that really excite me. Oh, you took my answer. I was going to say Prometheus. Um, well, because CoreOS, um, we, we uh, employ several of the, the key developers of Prometheus, and it's a core part of, um, of our, our um, efforts in contributing to um, monitoring upstream. But um, I guess I'll talk about Rocket and, and ContainerD. Um, those are two um, projects that um, were kind of donated around the same time, um, CoreOS and um, Docker, to the CNCF. Um, so I'm excited about all the increased uh, opportunities and options for people out there for running um, running containers. Excellent. And just a warning to the, the organizers in the back there, the countdown clock is still stuck on 20 here. So, okay, there we go. So I don't know if I have three or four minutes of free time, but uh, we'll just carry. Oh, there we go. It's down to 17 something now. So the race is back on. Uh, so let me maybe take it up a level. And before I do that, uh, we are certainly open to audience questions. Uh, we don't necessarily have to shuffle mics back and forth. If I can hear you, I will repeat the question for the camera, and we will be able to address your questions as well. So let me, cool. So let me just tee another one up, and then all you geniuses think of some good questions to ask us here. Um, in terms of not just technology, but you know, Mackenzie, last time we were on a panel together, I thought you had a fantastic answer to, what are some of the new business, perhaps disruptive business models that containers are enabling their users that might differ from traditional open stack or virtualization or more even you know more legacy client server deployments. Oh, I should say the same answer. Um, yeah, I, well li <laughs> I liked it last time. <laughs> um, well, um, I think uh, if I remember the answer I was talking about um, was well now I have two in my head that I'm thinking about. The first is um, thinking about what I do every day, which is um, at CoreOS we're 
rethinking how open source, how you can build sustainable companies um, with open source. And I think the two traditional business models are support and services, or you have sort of an open core proprietary layer model. And um, the problem with the first one is that it's, as a, from a business perspective, it's pretty low margin, right? You have to have a lot of people. Um, it's really time intensive, really people intensive. Um, and the second, the problem with the second, um, at least the way that we see it, is that it, it creates sort of bad incentive structures because um, the companies that build open core models are never really incentivized to improve um, or to bring value back into the open source project if they can sort of siphon away that value and package it up and sell it to a company, an enterprise company. And so sort of the third way that, that CoreOS is building, and we started this with Container Linux, is um, by focusing on sort of the cloud ops or the, the automated ops layer. So um, software, which we call operators, which know how to auto-maintain um, other pieces of software. And so, for example, with Container Linux, um, we're able to do this with the Linux kernel um, through core update. And then with Kubernetes, we're able to do this through um, something that we call um, self-driving or, or um, self-hosted Kubernetes, where we're able to drop in pieces of software called operators that know how to do no downtime rolling upgrades of, of Kubernetes itself. And so um, that's something I think is, I don't know if that was the same answer, but that's something I'm thinking about. Um, and the second, the second um, business model that I'm excited about is that I think I, I and I don't know what businesses will pop up because of they're able to better um, have faster deployment and delivery or they're able to um, take advantage of uh, massive scale and you know changes in in their traffic um, but I imagine that there are a lot of companies that that will be able to be built in the future that weren't be able to be built you know 10 years ago in the world of VMs when when infrastructure was much more static and you had a plan for um, for infrastructure uh, like um, that you know couldn't handle as much um, traffic and so I'm excited just to see that's the sort of the unknown um, but I'm excited to to see what companies will do with Kubernetes more than I am excited about talking about <laughs> Kubernetes um, itself. Yeah, it was the second one actually that was pretty cool. Go ahead, Steven. Oh, business models? <laughs> you know, what, what, what cool things that really have, you haven't seen before are you seeing companies do with Docker? So, well, I mean, one, one area is, is ARM um, and IoT devices. This is something, an area where the, the tooling is um, less developed because you're, sitting, you're you're targeting many more platforms and many more possibilities. So, um, and, and that community is very very uh, kind of maker esque. So they're they're willing to hack anything onto anything. And I think seeing that spirit uh, uh, be encouraged by in con uh, containers is an exciting thing to do. Um, I have no commentary on the business models, but uh, hopefully that we can we can see companies leverage the, leveraging this in. Uh, uh, in 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 innovative ways um, enabled through the in, enabled through the container ecosystem. So there's the the OCI image form, uh, format, for example, is very very flexible. So I think we'll see a lot of creative solutions that involve that um, and can target various different platforms for um, in ways that uh, they particularly view their their workloads. So. So for me, um, the value of containers in general, uh, from a business model standpoint, uh, resolve around a revolve around a number of things. Um, from an opportunistic standpoint, containers couldn't have come at a more important time from a, um, a trend standpoint in IT. Uh, when you think about IoT, when you think about ML and, and AI, um, any of these um, edge-oriented capabilities consumed by uh, a exponentially larger numbers of customers in smaller bytes, containers are an obvious answer for that, as is serverless going forward. So uh, the opportunity from a business model standpoint, as was mentioned earlier, is that there will be um, enormous number of new business models created where the barrier to entry because of the use of containers is much lower than any technologies before that. And that's been a historical trend within IT, whether it was mainframes to uh, minis to towers to blades to VMs to now containers, these trends have been required in order for us to meet the demands of IT going forward. From a personal perspective, what I'm excited about relative to containers is that, um, and pardon me, but you don't have to give a crap about containers. You can actually help yourself or you can help a customer make a major move to 
modernizing their ability to own and manage their infrastructure as a result of containerizing even legacy platforms without having to refactor them, without having to tear them apart and rebuild them again, which most organizations can't afford to do en masse. Um, and that drives innovation back into the organization um, by lowering cost of ownership and giving them opportunities to deploy in ways that they wouldn't have been able to deploy using traditional infrastructure. And, and I'm, when I say traditional, I am including VMs. I actually have something to, to, to tag on to that. I think um, another way, a layer up, than containers, so like Kubernetes, for example, um, can change the way that businesses consume easy to manage infrastructure um, is that a lot of the benefits that historically um, pass offerings, and, and Mark, maybe you have some commentary on this, um, pass offerings um, you know, could give, like you, know, you don't worry about your infrastructure, just worry about your apps. Those are kind of combined the, the promise that containers and Kubernetes give, because containers has so much, uh, or because Kubernetes has um, so many features now, like um, service discovery or, or, or um, self-healing or you know, auto-scaling that um, traditionally you would really only get in past products that really ease the, the burden of operating infrastructure um, from the end user. Um, and it's, it's free because it's open source. Um, and so I think that is something that will change the way moving forward has already been changing the way that, that people think about how much money they need to spend on infrastructure or allocate budget for, the, for that. Very cool. Any uh, audience questions? Go ahead, sir. Let me just quickly repeat that. You know, you know, you're a straight man, actually. It's one of my favorite topics, the state and storage and data. Uh, so the question is around state management in a container context and how it probably requires some different approaches, particularly to be true to the dynamic orchestration and so forth. So anyone care to comment on that? Well, the joke answer is, but containers are stateless. Um, well, so I think the, the, the key there is to pick a... Um, so let, let's let's step back. So if you look at the Hadoop ecosystem and you start wondering, well, what what made that popular? What made that happen? And you go, well, was it the MapReduce model, or was it you know this thing or this thing? And and if you and if you look at the common um, piece to it, it was the distributed file system. Um, so what the container industry really needs uh, that it doesn't quite have yet is the common distributed file system, which for Hadoop was HDFS. So without that, what do you do today? I think, I think for your organization, the, the best thing to do is to pick something and use that and get good at that and understand, and if, and if a solution comes along that the container ecosystem uh, provides and it's, and it's great and you can compare it and you can move to that or you can continue with that solution. So, uh, you know, it really depends on if you're in the cloud or if you're on, on premise and I don't want to make any recommendations, but yeah, so, so I, th I think picking, um, you know, try, trying out a couple of different solutions and seeing, and seeing where they land is, is the best approach. Um, uh, coming down the, uh, uh, like, there's the CSI, which is the Container Storage Initiative. I would watch that closely because I think that will have a great effect on container storage solutions. And, um, and, and there's, uh, you know, there's also a couple of open source projects that, that are out there that, that you can take a peek at that, that have varying different solutions. So, um, does that cover everything? Yeah, this is kind of a, a frothy space for startups as well. So there's a number, uh, you know, I can talk to you about offline if you're interested. I would also say that some of the old adages of the 12-factor manifesto in terms of using a, a single, well, not a single, but a, a well-defined API for a backing store. Uh, Kelsey Hightower used to say in the days before pet sets and stateful sets and volume semantics and Kubernetes that just network storage, you know, is that any node can access is, is not a bad way to start. There seems to be a bit of consensus here on the panel for that. Um, any other? That was a great opening question. Any other audience questions? Give you one more, sir. You got here. I'll give you the mic. You're, you're close enough. No. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my next question is: so uh, we deal with a lot of customers in both uh, uh, Linux and Java spaces, as well as a lot of customers in the Microsoft and .NET spaces, and where we're seeing a, a, um, a lot of lacking from uh, products like Kubernetes is, is in that. Microsoft space, or are you guys making any headway in that space, and are you looking to expand into that environment set? 
Yeah, I mean, um, I'll, I'll start, and then I, I know that you guys have, have done a lot of work around um, .NET apps, right, and Windows support, um, but it's definitely a, it's definitely a um, an area that the Kubernetes ecosystem is looking to grow its um, its offerings, and I think, um, for example, Brendan Burns moving, um, you know, who was one of the architects of Kubernetes, moving to Azure to really lead up a lot of their um, Kubernetes and container initiatives on Azure. I think is a and um, Microsoft acquiring Deus um, and having. Um, having their leadership there um, really direct a lot of their container initiatives is a really good sign because it means that um, you know, two of the key players in the container um, or in the container and Kubernetes ecosystem have are directly working on those problems at Azure. And I know that um, when when we just an example a small example is that when at CoreOS we were looking to support Tectonic on Azure, um, Tectonic is our enterprise Kubernetes um, uh, distribution. Um, we uh, the Azure team literally came to our office and like hacked with us for two days, right, to like get you know get it working on Tectonic. I mean they really are interested and in, and there's a lot of collaboration there between the Azure team and the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, so the answer is that yes, we're aware, but definitely um, looking to expand that since it is such a massive market. Any other Microsoft related comments, Azure related comments? So uh, yeah, when Microsoft says they love Linux, I believe them. Um, they I love that sticker. It was like, the sticker was like the most, like, it was like the epitome of like a 10 year like war, you know, it was just like, like in a little sticker. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be able to comment too much on Kubernetes. I have every confidence like that their model can uh, distribute work to uh, Microsoft workloads. The, uh, the real work right now, um, at least for that, that I see, is, is happening in making the Windows experience uh, on par with, with, the, uh, with the Linux experience. So there's a lot of work in getting the graph drivers to behave that uh, the right way, getting the networking to behave the, the way that we expect from, um, we'll say, Docker, uh, and then also um, you know future container models like like with Containerd. So we're doing work in, in there as well to make this this ex to bring to bring the same experience to bring the, the be able to relocate your workload without caring about it too much. Um, so uh, another another project is, is SwarmKit, and we have a very similar like like node announcement model that that is able to say, hey, I'm a Windows node, and you can schedule workloads. And for the most part, it's it's uh, it's invariant to the particular operating system that you're on. As long as you can run the image, it works. And um, I don't see any reason Kubernetes won't be able to do that in the future. It's really the the run times that are kind of holding this back. And not 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 too badly. So, and, and Microsoft is working on this, and I expect to see um, a very interesting set of uh, deployments in the future. So will it convert converge into a service fabric, a single service fabric? I'm not really familiar with what a service. What you mean by a service fabric? Is that a specific? I mean, if it makes sense for them, I would I would guess so. But I, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, well, we'll talk about Linkerd later. So uh, there's um, time for one more audience question or a closing question. I have. Is there? A, go ahead, ma'am. I'm not hearing. I'll just I'll come up closer. Yeah, since this panel is on cloud native, I'm, I'm just curious to hear from some of you um, on the enterprise segment, where do you see some of the biggest opportunities for this open and premium kind of business models? And uh, you know, what are some of the key verticals also where you're seeing some of this adoption taking off? No, no, I think you shared them. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm not positive I got the question entirely, um, but if I understood it correctly, you're asking um, what are enterprises doing from an adoption standpoint? Where do we see opportunities versus risks, et cetera, right? Um, one of the, and verticals, yeah. So, I mean, speaking for us, uh, we don't actually have a specific vertical. We're seeing it coming from across the board, but, and this may be, 
counterintuitive to a room full of folks that are here because of open source and containers, but the average enterprise still doesn't know how to spell containers, right? I mean, they want containers, they've got developers playing with containers, but less than 1% of the apps in the enterprise today are in production on containers. That doesn't mean there's not an opportunity, there's an enormous opportunity, um, but most people are still stumbling over, do I just wrap it in a container and put it in cloud? Do I have to refactor it? Is wrapping it even an option? Uh, what do I do to get, how do I get out from underneath the legacy burden I've got right now in order to work on innovative opportunities that might include containers, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and we have to keep in mind that for us, the idea of containers, the idea of Kubernetes, the idea of AppSera, the ap idea of Docker, it's all like, wow, that's a shiny object. Let me go chase it. But in an in enterprise, there has to be the why first. The why might include containers as part of the solution, but containers are not the solution before you have a why. And so that's really the, from a CNCF standpoint, um, and from a vendor standpoint in this space, whether you're an integrator or a, somebody selling software or open source into that environment, that's the biggest hurdle, is, right, is really how do you get started? Because it's sort of, in, in this space right now, it's sort of like the first cars. Yeah, the other, the other panel, the other okay, sorry. Uh, well, so I think the the biggest I, I'm going to address the, inter, the enterprise adoption. I'm not super familiar with the verticals and the businesses and whatnot. I'm, but um, but the the main the main thing stopping enterprise adoption is a lot of the best practice in um, that are suggested in containers are around like change the way you write your app so that it fits into the container model, which um, isn't great because like it's like well I don't have time or I don't have a team or like. I can't compile this anymore. We compiled it in 2007, and that's it. So uh, we have to find a way, find models to make it work. So there, you know, there's there's tools to you know take existing applications and repackage them in containers. I, uh, there's like a VM where it's called Image to Docker. Or something. That's an example of one that 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 does that. And I think seeing more of these projects that can help existing enterprise workflows, uh, like work in the container space, is where this is going to be. Where where, where we're going to see that more of this happen. Yeah, I guess I'll I'll close and just say that while we haven't seen, I think none of our, the panelists have really seen um, specific verticals, industry verticals, where this is um, cloud native adoption or Kubernetes or container adoption is really springing up. Um, my personal theory is that the um, where I've seen actually the most commonality is um, industries that care that either have really, really low, like a lot of competition, where they need to be able to optimize on developer workflow or speed of development. Like that's that is important enough that they would go through entire infrastructure rearchitecture in order to get that you know one or two percent speed gain, um, or you know twenty percent or whatever um, they end up getting. And um, the second is um, industries where. Uh, there is a lot of volatile scale in, in workloads. Um, so um, Ticketmaster is a CoreOS customer, and they, I mean, like, they literally just DDoS themselves every time there's a Jay-Z concert, you know? <laughs> it's just like, the spike is insane in terms of their traffic that hits their website um, at random, you know, they can somewhat predict it, but they don't know how popular certain concerts will be. Um, or financial services is another one that, that handles that type of stuff. So there are some common reasons, I think, why, why initial company or verticals start doing it, but there isn't like an overall trend, I would say. That's gonna have to be our last word. I wanna thank all the panelists very much. Thank you.